Let us now go to Wisconsin, where Professor Harvey J.K. is standing by. He is the author of countless books, his latest is FDR on Democracy. They are republishing one of his earlier works. on The first book about British Marxist historians, we'll ask you about that in a second, is being published, very exciting. Also with us is Alan Minsky, executive director of the Progressive Democrats of America. And the two of you co-wrote a piece for Common Dreams. I think it was yesterday entitled A 21st Century Economic Bill of Rights. And we can talk about that. We should talk about British Marxist historians. But first, Ukraine, the invasion of Ukraine, for it or against it, Professor K? <laughs> uh, I'm, I, I'm By the way, one. we were, before you answer, Friday night, John Hayes video, videoed Nina Turner speaking at a fundraiser in some fancy home in Beverly Hills or Brentwood, where Alan Minsky, executive director of Progressive Democrats of America, spoke and the great Nina Turner, who everybody should contribute to, not only blew the roof off, even though it was outdoors, she kept mentioning Professor Harvey J.K. Uh, I get mentioned in all the right places. Yes, yes. <laughs> Let's talk about that. Alan Minsky, before we let's talk about what uh, Nina Turner said about Professor Harvey J.K. Well, I mean, I, I actually want to say that um, Harvey and I wrote this article and we published it and we were talking, you know, about 10 days ago. And, um, would you want to write this article? You know, Harvey said and I said, I don't know. Uh, what else could we do? And we it was it was it was just between writing the article and invading ukraine we had to to the article. <laughs> by the way <laughs> professor adnan hussein i think it was professor adnan hussein maybe maybe i'm getting thinks you might want to add a few more numbers we're, yeah we're i mean already... look adnan hussein is great i he's fantastic and uh, you know he says so many things that are i just you know crib notes whenever he speaks but uh I mean, you know, you got to have not so many of these things, you know, or it gets starting to get, it would get. Can't bring it up to the end. Come on, you live in Hollywood, Alan. It's nominate every film for Best Picture. Yeah, that, that's right. <laughs> we, they, they increase the number of films nominated for Best Picture. Bring it up to 10. Are they giving a, an award at the Academy Awards this year for self esteem? <laughs> Everybody gets. That's right. That. <laughs> I will repeat the six rights later on. How do people read your piece? It, I'm sorry? We have eight. We you increased eight. them. I, wait, there's a new edition. Oh, cr I sent you. Oh, didn't I? I just put, I I just put it in the chat. I just put it, I just put it in the chat. You added two We're, new rights? Yes. And, yeah, no, we, we, and not only that, we loaded up. A few of them have uh, extra things in it. Uh, Bernie was just really, I don't know what. Well, I mean, obviously, he, he's... Frank Luntz is, says Bernie Sanders is a genius of political messaging because he's so succinct and repeats so often. Well, he went for succinct. I think five of his six had only six words in them, the right two and then three words. Um, right. And one had eight words. I, speaking in defense of Bernie, I think if you check his website, it's true. It's a very stripped down bill of rights, economic bill of rights. But he had these other pages, which he probably thinks address the other things that might have ended up in it. But indeed, they were the six were essential. Alan and I worked through, and I got to tell you, I mean, we, we really did work. It, it, it wasn't like you know, flippant kind of stuff we were doing. We we really really worked. We, we sought out consultations with good people, and you know, I I had a I worked hard on it with Alan, but I also can tell you that I think the response to it, and it's only just beginning, has that has really been. It's really been good. I, I, there's one that occurred today that I'm really, really pleased. There's a state representative in New Hampshire named Chris Schultz, 
who I've become friendly with by way of Twitter and email this last, um, I guess it's several months now. And she's been pushing as hard as she could, as hard as she can uh, for a raise in the, a rise, a raise in the minimum wage in New Hampshire. And when she saw this today, she got really excited and she set out in the open, I'm going to embrace this and, and really fight for this. And, I, and I'm thinking that it, it will capture people's imaginations. If any of you feel like you're too far from national politics to make a difference, but you know state representatives, take the Economic Bill of Rights in the form that it appeared yesterday. Is that the link you put up, Alan, at the chat? I, I'm not looking. Yes, it is. Yeah, please send it to your state representatives. The idea is to really cultivate a conversation, a discourse, let it really let it rise up in the public rhetoric as a as a as a possibility, a vision, a promise, uh, an agenda, however you want to look at it. Just go to the Common Dreams website. Common Dreams website, right? There and, it is. Yeah, Alan, and, it, and then spread it. And yeah, and I have to say, Alan, Alan had must have. Must be a powerful guy because we finally finished it Wednesday night. And he said, I'm going to send it to Common Dreams. And he said that we'd like to see it tomorrow morning. And bam, it was there the next morning. I don't even think Alan was awake yet. I was awake. I don't think he was awake yet. <laughs> um, right. Yeah. And, and we couldn't have chosen a better time because but, but we right. made the wrong decision. Clearly, invading Ukraine gets more attention. Than our well, without being... Uh, conspiratorial. It sure seems that Build Back Better, the social safety net, Bernie's economic bill of rights is dead. And like clockwork, Joe Biden's now a uh, foreign policy president going into the midterms. Is this what Biden wants right now? A, a, a major foreign policy crisis to no. burnish his stature is no, he it's not a far, is, no i i wouldn't buy that at all because it, this could make it, well it's a distraction in the media but it's not a distraction when you consider the degree to which this is a, a this is a crisis that really could further reveal the 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 cons, the weakness that prevails inside of american public life how so well, I mean, the division with, I mean, the division within the United States, I mean, you've got all these folks who think Putin's a hero, I mean, with their t-shirts running around, and uh, the Republicans are, are going to latch onto anything they can to make him seem weak and irrelevant. So I, I can't imagine, I, it's, I really can't. I think, I think they were probably hoping or at least the Democrats who, who think that the Build Back Better mattered, I think they were already figuring out how to carve it up and try to get something done. But right. I don't think, I, I can't imagine, no, I don't buy it. Well, what is going on inside the Republican Party? I thought that Tucker Carlson and Donald Trump were outliers, that people, the mainstream Republicans wanted us to, impose economic sanctions against Putin. Lindsey Graham has certainly spoken out against Putin. Is there a groundswell of support in this country for Putin other than the craziness coming out of well, Trump? I'll come back to well, your point about the Republican Party. The um, There is no such thing as a mainstream Republican Party. It's, there just isn't. It's a reactionary tide that we, we hope we can you know either build a proper dike to, to stop or whatever but it's there's no mainstream republican party so is Mitch mcconnell in fact the one thing that may save these democrats is that the republicans may continue to reveal themselves for what they are and the democrats can run a campaign which fuck them for doing it if that's all they do but sorry i'm speaking my mind here um the fact is that if they if they want to run on a we're not Republicans, then please, I can only hope that the you know, here's what I'd like to see happen. Let me come back to what matters. I want us to get this economic bill of rights into the hands 
of the real progressives in the Democratic Party. And I'm not talking just about the squad. I'm talking about Jamie Raskin. I've been talking to his congressional aide. I'm talking about, uh, you know, folks who are there as progress, who are progressives. OK, they, they may not be as young and in quotes as, you know, sexy as the men and women of the squad because they're not that young. But there are progressives in the Democratic Party. And the idea is to give them something to start. I'm just using, you know, to start rallying around. And I think this Economic Bill of Rights could be just that. No one expects that. No one expects constitutional amendments immediately, but they do expect that the Democrats might find a way. The progressive Democrats and the ones we hope to get elected will find their way to grab hold of the best, as Lincoln would have said, angels of our nature, as FDR would have said, you know, to redeem the promise of America, whatever it might be, and to fight on those terms. Don't fight around around an agenda, fight around a vision that has an agenda associated with it. Does capitalism have an immunosystem that when it experiences a wave of progressivism, it, its immunosystem kicks in and brings about world war? That it seems to me World War I came after a massive progressive movement in this country and world war ii came after a great progressive movement in the 30s we're seeing a a failed but uh, volatile progressive movement all it would take is an acceleration in ukraine to kill the progressive movement here in the united states worldwide a big war Lot, yeah, there's a lot backwards about what you're saying. First of all, the progressive movement in the um, end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, nothing that happened in the United States um, um, uh, sparked World War One. World War One was the year getting us War. into World War One, distracting us by sending troops. World War Two. It's a a major war is a great way to turn our attention away from a social safety. Net. Yeah, d d domestically, it's true. The the, uh, the um the um eventual engagement in World War One, of course, yeah, did create reactionary politics in the nineteen twenties, um, and uh, staunched um, the American left. Though, but you know, the great moment for the international left happened after we were committed to participate in the war. Right, so we entered before Lenin won in in petersburg right uh, professor k well, well talk about I, something I, I should know somebody else could probably know the exact dates but it's all 1917 it's all 1917 and um um so yeah that's that's a little tenuous now in terms of world war ii uh once again the centrality of american actions in sparking the war i think that's a questionable thing but even more against your point david is um and the guy that was saying to the guy who makes this case very well young foreign policy analyst um you know the left has to be aware of how we got where we got world war ii guided by the roosevelt administration did not result in um a weakening of the left domestically in the united states of america there was a pushback immediately at the end of the war the republicans actually won control of Congress, the House for a couple of years. Um, in fact, the only four years they, they held the House was in the decade after World War II, um, all the way up until 1994 from 1933, right? But um, that's the anti-communist backlash, the business backlash that occurred. Um, but overall, you have very, very high unionization rates. And while it's true, the left, especially the radical left, um, was um, forced and, and, and tremendously marginalized from about 1948 uh, through to the 60s, um, um, or at least the very late 50s. Um, I, I think the um, gains of the American working class in that era, not only that, but there was a, there's a difficult and hard to, um, I mean, to deny it and to disclaim it, I think, that there was a symbiotic relationship between um, 
you know, U.S. military dominance and growth and the wealth of the American middle class in that era. Um, it's not a direct causality, but I think, you know, it's, it's, it's um, historical revisionism on behalf of the left to not recognize that was part of the component. And I don't just mean that they you know, controlled the world and the wealth came in. Um, the whole World War II uh, military buildup created a massive government debt that then flowed back out into the economy over the next two decades. Uh, and that was the most prosperous period in American society. So the idea that the throughout our history that the military industrial complex has been singularly the enemy of the American working class is is not accurate. You don't worry that they can't give us build back better. They can't provide. Oh, yeah. Now that's something completely different. It's completely different. But nonetheless, look, American prosperity, look, American prosperity is a very paradoxical thing that even amongst ourselves, I think the I think the left too often overcomplicates their efforts to uh, analyze. Um, they both oversimplify and overcomplicate. Um, the analysis of American wealth. American wealth is um, really a, a phenomenally unique thing. We have all the mass aggregate wealth issues, average household wealth, GDP, the entirety of the consumer economy. We're number one, you know? We are, uh, you know, the New York Yankees <laughs> with, uh, you know, DiMaggio going over to Mantle, right? Here we go. Um, more Yankee Stadium shit. Yep. Yeah. Um, but um, but then by every meaningful social index, um, health, diet, um, um, poverty, uh, homelessness, mass incarceration, drug addiction, divorce, um, everything. We're the worst of any industrial technological country. And the precarity of the average person is much more extreme than is in Western Europe or in South Korea now, Japan. How is that? How is how is our precarity connected to our prowess worldwide? Um, again, um, I mean, we're just a very, very unique country and we're the only military imperial hegemon in the world now. Um, we have the top university system in the world with a maleducated general population, right? But we, so we, we, we spend an incredibly, incredibly unique instance. Do we have to be, do we have to have precarity? It's only a trillion dollars that we're spending each year on our defense. No, no, we don't. Look, we don't. I'll answer your question straight up. No, we don't. Okay. Uh, 1948 to 1973 saw incredible economic growth, but actually a decline in inequality in the United States during the period of time in which the United States was the hegemonic power globally. Okay, and the difference is is that coming out of World War II, despite the reactionary post Cold War stuff, the labor movement was truly a movement. One of every three workers was in a labor union. Capital could not get away with, with certain kinds of things, but that's the period in which the military industrial complex develops. Yeah. Okay, and which is why it's Eisenhower in, in, what, in his farewell remarks warns us all about, you know, I'm sure he was utterly amazed at what he was being asked to approve during his two terms as president and worried about the fact that the budgets of the United States were being tied to future military spending. Because indeed, if, if you're going to have a massive military industrial complex, you've got to start spending now in favor of weapon systems five and right. 10 years or whatever. And he and said every nuclear, he said every sub is a school and a university we can't have. Is that true? Can't, can, can we have guns and butter? And which is more dangerous for your health, guns or butter? <laughs> Daniel Bessner is the guy I was thinking of. He's a young guy. I think he's at the Quincy Institute now. Calls himself a Marxist. He did um, um, counsel Bernie Sanders on foreign policy. He's a guy who can talk U.S. foreign policy in a room with other foreign policy experts. And he's also a leftist. And he's straight up on some interview I saw said, 
The left does not understand the relationship of U.S. militarism and our empire to the domestic economy. And even the question, is the fact of our empire and our military being so much larger than everyone else's, is it a negative for the general economic impact in our society? Or do we even understand that relationship? I mean, as simple as you know, most people would think, you have a global empire, the beneficiaries are gonna include the citizenry in the, in the coronation. That's an open question. Are we beneficiaries of that? And, and then we might be very much beneficiaries. There's just, he said, there simply are not enough studies done of what would seem to be an essential question. But again, you know, this is the thing. Does it make the dollar stronger? In other words, if we are the preeminent power in the world, then you're going to use this country as a tax haven. Why give your money to Switzerland, which has no army, when you can put it in the United States, which is inviolable? That's why we are the preeminent tax haven in the world. Does the Nobody's military- conquered Switzerland. Keep that in mind. I'm sorry. Nobody has conquered Switzerland. We have. No. Nope. Well, we've conquered it because we now have stolen their business model. We are now where bad money goes. So bad money. there's so much bad money out there. It goes everywhere. But we're we're the number one tax. And I think the military has something to do with that. Oh, yeah, it does. Um, but, you know, he actually well, I remember his I, answer. You know, that's not clear either. That's not clear either. I mean, the. Psychologically, what, what, what makes the United States? No, no. Look, what 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 has made the United States such an appealing place for Russian oligarchs to to put their money in, presumably Chinese oligarchs too, if they can get away with it, is the fact that capitalism is strong, and the vast majority of Americans don't seem to be bothered by that fact. They're not worried that the that the that the tallest apartment building ever, or whatever the hell you know that thing on Fifty Seventh Street in New York. Um, Nobody's storming the apartment building and it would be kind of a waste to do it, given the fact that nobody of consequence lives there. It's just literally a place to place your money with the idea of having it sit and collect uh, interest on it. Right. So um, no, it's the security. Of, it's just generally the security of, uh, of, of American life. That, that's what makes it such so appealing. I, I think, I think well, when it, there's it, tremendous it, economic volatility. When there's tremendous economic volatility, as there was in 07 and 08, and it's almost never even questioned throughout the whole process that the uh, federal treasury bonds are the most um, uh, yeah, safest right. uh, conservative investment in the world. I think somewhere not too far down the line, the fact of the military uh, total domination um, is, is one of the reasons that that was the case. Um, so it's in the notes, but, but yeah, it's but pretty, pretty disconnected. Um, yeah, and Bessner actually said, um, if he, if Bernie had won, and he had um, um, been in a position of being in the administration, one thing he would have done is study the books to get answers to the questions because he feels like nobody's really asked this. You know, well, the question this came. Thing? By the way, the question came up. I, I, it wouldn't surprise me if he, if he, in his, he's a historian, by the way, not a, not a political scientist. And it wouldn't surprise me if he's read about these debates. I mean, the longstanding debate has been whether or not Britain actually benefited by way of its empire. But it, it, the real question was who benefited by way of the empire? Right. OK. Um, you know, it provided jobs to Scots who went off to fight and Welshmen who went off to fight, provided officerships for Scottish colonels and, and generals. Um, but surely the incomes were you know, something else. It also, it also provided investments into Brazil, Argentina, and elsewhere. I mean, one of the things about world about a world economy and capitalism is there's a lot of irony is in it. It's not all like, oh, evil, evil, evil. We, if you can't appreciate the ironies, you're never going to appreciate why people are happy to accept it. Okay, because it sure as hell beats feudalism. Let's start there, okay? Whereas I think I said, I think I said to you, Alan, right, about... Uh, uh, Robinson, Joan Robinson's great remark. The only thing worse than being exploited is to be unemployed. Lane sent me a documentary about the British Empire. And Lane is a friend of the show. He's in yes, CNN. Right. 
brilliant, scary, brilliant guy. And he sent me this documentary about how in the 60s, the, it became apparent to London, not the city of London, but the, there's a banking capital of London. It became apparent that the empire was over, that they would, uh, th that the pound would have to be uh, kept track of for taxes, but Euro dollars that are passing through Great Britain could be deposited on uh, offshore accounts. So they created the Cayman Islands, the Isle of Jersey, and that the, 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 banking, the bankers of London created a shadow banking system that is more profitable than anything the British Empire could have dreamt dreamed of that that taking on uh offshore hiding money from taking money from African corrupt African generals Duvalier and Haiti taking from oligarchs the it the the bankers in Britain discovered in the 60s forget extracting oil from a country take its money you just get the money and invest it and it's an interesting documentary and i i think it's true something like 30 percent of the world's gdp is shadow money yeah roosevelt really ingeniously um basically um destroyed defeated the british empire um in the setup to world war ii um through the land lease arrangements and um I think he was he was definitely um, working towards um, inheriting that from and geographically from the British. Um, the British capitalists, however, um, their global um, um, uh, what's the word? Pen penetration of, of global markets. Um, I think a Swiss Italian group did a study of the corporations that had the largest amount of international market penetration. I think seven of the 10 were based or six of the 10 were based in the city of London, Lloyd's, Barclays, HSBC, um, a number of them. And um, that's still the case. And of course, the city of London, while smaller than Wall Street, represents a larger percentage of the UK economy than Wall Street does in the United States. And we don't know how big the, the British banking system is, because we're not allowed to know how many euro dollars they're keeping for people offshore. Yeah, they definitely set up the offshore system. By the way, one thing I think you're wrong about is I think the Cayman Islands were the American response to the British offshoring uh, um, yeah. islands and stuff. Okay. By the way, the, uh, they ever talk to you, they ever, tell, they ever talk on here about my time on Wall Street? You were a broker? No, I was in ba international banking. You? Tell me about it. Yeah. Yeah, and between when I, I so I did my master's degree at the University of London between University College London and London School of Economics, and I came back to the states in, in seventy two, and so in seventy and I was looking for for work. I, I my original plan was to go in some kind of government service, public service, whether it was State Department or I even took the test for the National Security Agency and passed, but there was a hiring freeze. So um, I, uh, I, I interviewed and was, I was offered a job on Madison Avenue with the, with the second largest of the advertising agencies. I was offered a job with a huge, biggest, one of the biggest three national trucking firms. And anyhow, I didn't take those. And then I, I ended up being offered a job. It's a long story, but I'll make it quick. With Lloyd's Bank International offices were then on 95 Wall Street. I didn't want any one of these jobs that I was interviewing for, but I was waiting to see if I could possibly go do a PhD. And in the meantime, because and I, and I would have had to have been paid for the PhD. So I figured, what if I didn't get money? So I, I went, on, work, went to work for the British bank and it was absolutely fascinating. And another night I could probably tell better stories because it's getting late, but I'll never forget that there was a, there was a door. This was in 19, okay, so this was, this was 73, the bank, the bank had been nationalized in Chile, okay? One of the reasons that I was hired, by the way, is 
Lloyds Bank International was very big in Latin America. They were, it was originally known as the Bank of London in South America, Bolsa, which also means like a purse in Spanish. It was very effective. Uh, well, so, and this was the age also of urban guerrillas in uh, Argentina and Uruguay and Chile, they had been nationalized. So when I was at the bank, I, and I'm not gonna tell the, the funniest stories, I'll just tell this story. There was always this door I would walk by. And, and I said to someone, because I, I was just new, I said, what's, what's in there? You know, it's, it had, it had a, essentially like a no admittance kind of thing. And this one, one young uh, fellow, English guy said, oh, that's where the Chilean accounts are kept. Mm. Now, that's, that wasn't legal, okay, basically. So they had figured out, you know, they knew how to get, that, you know, vast accounts before the doors came down completely out of there and into there. I'll also tell you, I, can, I, I mean, yeah, actually, I'll I will tell the story. What the hell? So... They never had a training program for Americans. I was the, I was a guinea pig in this program in, in, for the bank. They never had an American trainee. Period. And um, so they were tra they were just sending me from like a few weeks in one department, a few weeks in another. It was generally boring. It was definitely not the life I wanted. Um, but at, at one stretch, they had me sit for two weeks at at the first floor reception area. By the way, these banks could not operate as a regular bank. They were strictly international lending, but they still had these, you know, reception areas down on, you know, what a New York City street looks like. And you're on the corner and there's a, you know, set of offices. And I was sitting at one of the desks. I had a young woman admin assistant in front of me, so they couldn't come directly to me. And I'll never forget, they never told me what I might expect. So I'm sitting there and you know, I, I was wearing a suit as I didn't wear a three piece. I want to spend that kind of money. I had a suit on. So a guy walks in and I could hear in Spanish that he wanted to see someone of, uh, with authority. And she turned and pointed, you can see Mr. K, okay? And he comes over to me and he says, uh, can we be alone? And I said, well, we can go into, there was a glass, you know, a glass enclosure office. Hey, we can go in there. No, no, can we go somewhere where no one can see us? And I said, um, I tell you what, give me a moment, give me a moment. Because at one point he actually said, can we go to the men's room? It was that kind of moment. So I said, I had to ask someone upstairs something. So I went upstairs quickly to one of the offices, to the to this vice president, and not a senior, but a vice president who I was working with. And I said to him, there's this man downstairs and he wants to see me. By, and he asked me, how was he dressed? I said, he had a three-piece suit on, blah, blah, blah. And he said, I think I know who that is. Take him into the men's room. So we go into the offices on that floor. We go to the men's room. He takes off his jacket. He take, undoes his vest. He lifts up his shirt. And he pulls off a money belt. Mm. And it had $50,000 in it. This is 1973. So what would that be today? Would you buy, a, would that be a quarter of a million? Yeah, sure. Right? And, he, and he hands me the cash. I'm holding the cash. So I go back up to, to the vice president and I said, what do I do? He goes, take it to whatever her name was. She's going to check for counterfeits. What it was is this guy had come up from Buenos Aires. And what they had realized in the bank network is that there were folks working in the bank who would make notes as to who has ready access to cash. And then they, and much of the urban guerrilla stuff was actually kidnappings for the sake of raising monies. So, and this happened a couple, this happened at least a couple of times during those two weeks. From there, you know, actually there was a guy who even came from Chile even after the nationalization. So there must've been about three times or something like that. So it was exciting times. I learned a lot about international bank. I learned nothing about international banking, but I learned a lot about. And they're gangsters. If you, a, a successful banker is comfortable laundering money for mobsters. And the only way you can be comfortable around mobsters is if your father or mother was an old time mobster. I mean, that's what happened to the five families. Well, when I told my, my, I would tell the story to my students. 
because I used to say to them, I should be getting paid what the business professors are getting paid because I'm the only one with Wall Street experience in this whole university. But nevertheless, they said to me, well, didn't you want to take the $50,000 and run with it? Because quarter of a million in counterpart dollars. I said, yeah, but you mentioned gangsters. I said, yeah, but I also knew I also knew there was not a chance in hell I could escape Manhattan alive. <laughs> OK, well, we have to we have to wrap it up. I am. I hope you found that entertaining yes, a little insight I, into my path. here is most podcast hosts don't offer get rich quick schemes. But I was reading about this last year. This. If you listen to me now, I will teach you how to make a fortune. And I mean this. OK, now you give me two minutes. OK, yeah. If you need money and I mean big money. Listen, pay very care. I'm not, this is not a joke. This is for my sake or the, or the audience? Everybody's sake. OK. Find a hundred friends. OK. That's tough. Call, call 100 people or 50, but I, I. OK. Divide the list. Now, pay attention to this and you will thank me. And this will work. And it's not a joke. Divide your friends 50, 50, two, two columns. The first 50, you call your 50 friends and say, hey, I have a tip. Go buy Apple stock. It's selling at 50 today or 160. Buy more Apple stock today. The other column, the other 50, you call 50 other friends and say, hey, I have a tip short Get, call your broker or go on E-Trade and short Apple stock today. I have a tip at Apple, right? The next day, you find out if Apple went up or it went down. If Let's say it went up. So you look at the 50 people who you called to buy Apple stock because you were right. You divide them in two. Now you have two columns of 25 and 25. And you call the same 25, you say, I want you to, I had another tip on Apple, buy Apple. The other 25, you say, I have a tip on Apple, short it. See where we're going with this? The next no. day. Okay, but, but keep going, please. The next day, you if Apple went up, you take the list of 25 people who you told to buy, right? Divide them in half, 12 and 12. Keep what doing do you do with the 25th? You, you, well, you round it off. Fuck me, sorry. The point is, yes. you, you will find about five, by the time you, you weed them down to 10, you will have five people who will have gotten a call from you about eight times where you said, do this with Apple and you can't go wrong. And they'll think you have inside information. And then you say, hey, I've, I've steered you right eight times on Apple stock. I have a tip, but you need to give me money. You get, need to give me money. I've been right eight times and, you, and they give you money and you change your name and move to the Cayman Islands, which, by the way, is a British. I'm yes. pretty sure it is British. Right. It's British? Yeah. Yes. Oh, Cayman Islands, yes. He's thinking of the Milt Cayman Islands, named after the great comedian Milt Cayman. I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, you think I'm joking. You do this and you will make a fortune. You just have to be willing to take money and rip off about five people. And if you're not willing to do that, you don't deserve. I know that my I know that my pension depends upon investments that I don't make myself, but I do not own a single share of stock. Nor should you. Thank you. Yeah. 
that's our show i guess uh henry uh i i'm going to assume henry's in russia um i don't know if he's left i don't know he's been arrested maybe he's arrested i don't know but henry is not uh that's too bad i was looking forward to going in country henry is behind enemy lines with a finnish name no less i know oh my god you're right yeah maybe no yeah they 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 didn't join nato you're absolutely right i hope he's not finished you do know the finno-russian war sino-finnish war however you want to call it not sino what i mean is russo finnish finnish russian when 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 was that 1940 and when it ended when when hitler moved east into poland russia went from the west into poland and also there was war between russia and finland but it was romantic they had skis i remember in parkas it looked fun and fun. Nokia was allowed. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Hey, when does your new book come out? That's not till September, the end of September. That if you read the thing I sent you, that was a little disappointing. On the other hand, I got enough going. Alan and I are gonna gonna make history with an economic bill of rights. Read it over at Common Dreams. Go to Common Dreams right now and read Professor Harvey JK and Alan Minsky's. 21st century economic bill of rights and go to uh go to wherever you buy books and pick up fdr and democracy take hold of our history the fight for the four freedoms what is the name of the thomas Paine book thomas Paine and the promise of america my that was 2005 and it's my obama. letter to america o- obama it's on obama's bookshelf yeah. buy it nevertheless <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, David. <laughs>